we have here a scene in which the Lord, with his divine authority, calms the forces of the underworld. We have seen recently how he exercises that divine authority to calm even the elements of nature, storms on the sea and the like. Here it is a personal force, that of the demon. We know that where demons move, there is unpeace, unrest, uncalm, and people who are in that mode, without knowing it, reflect who they are imitating and whose company is familiar to them. People who, by nature, emit much noise are creating around themselves a whole cloud, a black cloud often, of heaviness. For noise creates heaviness. Even children actually, when graced and brought up in a family of prayer, instinctively dislike a lot of noise. E.g. in class there can be a lot of noise. I once heard a friend of mine, a priest who comes here, Father Michael Marr, quote a confrere of his, probably now long dead. He said, hell is full of noise. And that was probably in a classroom context that people in class who create disruption are playing the game of the demon. It happens also in church life that one sees that people who are, without aware of it, a nuisance, are actually playing the game of the demon, creating disunity, creating actual noise in church. I mean even sometimes in liturgical atmospheres, creating a loud noise where more gentle singing is what perhaps would lead to genuine prayer. Noise in the house of God is often not of divine origin, but demonic. And the demon often inspires people, without knowing it, to act in his name. It can actually even be a person preaching or writing. It's sufficient that amongst the good things that he's saying, a little bit of error comes in. And that's how the demon works, convincing people by the people of God themselves but also on people who are exercising ministries here and there, e.g. music ministries, whatever it might be, even prayer groups, there can be people who are noisy, cumbersome, clumsy, and nuisances, and the demon makes use of them to wreck the peace of a prayer group or an assembly. So just be aware, people who are noisy, cumbersome, and clumsy are a nuisance on every level, and we mustn't add to their number. With regard to noise itself, when one is living the monastic life and brought up in it, one sees the difference between the cloister and the absence of protection from noise. Once one is outside the front door and involved in anything, whether it be a supermarket or even actually a bus by now, one has noise pumped at one. And one observes the comportment of people around, even from an early age, they are in noisy mode. If they can't find someone to talk to, they have their ears full of noise from a machine to which they are plugged. Even jogging along, one sees it, they are plugged into noise. Therefore, all quietness is excluded from morning until night. And we can also, if you're not careful, be playing the same game. It's so easy to actually put on noise. It's there just at the opening of a key. I would want, however, to comment on one specific point. It's this. There is also, on a deeper level, a problem with regard to noise. It actually lowers the quality of perception. Much noise takes away 
delicacy of perception. One sees it very clearly in the difference between how, for instance, in the monastic life, where normally there should not be artificial noise, a book is very loud in its effect on the quiet soul. In the noisy world outside, people do not even have the slightest interest for the quiet page quite often. It has to be heavy bombardment on a screen to get their attention, and children too are contaminated because they're fidgety in class. That is an evolution in 50 years which I have observed. It is not easy to actually talk to children without something very exciting. And so we are in that. People no longer read, actually, for much length of time. They can't. They are contaminated by noise. They need impulses. They can't sit still. The thinker, the philosopher Blaise Pascal, the French thinker about the, he's writing about the 1600s there, he has this word, Toute la misère de l'homme, all the misery of man, vient du fait, comes from the fact, qu'il ne sait pas s'asseoir seul et rien faire, that he doesn't know how to sit alone and do nothing. We can look at that carefully in our day. Can we sit alone and do nothing, I mean to say, physically? Are we capable of living inside our skin with our thoughts, and in our case, with our Maker? Letting him genuinely, with his words, at last get through, because that's what it boils down to. We, ha we can't really listen on a deep level if even when on those precious moments when we're in prayer, we're still in mode of noise. People can't actually really enter into the silent voice of God. I just conclude, we are disfavoured also in the West, compared specifically with the East, with regard to that, insofar as especially in this part of the world, the Catholic world, our liturgies are fairly short, even on Sunday. Whereas in the Eastern world, they will be very long. The difference, of course, is they don't be there for all the time. They'll be there for the last hour out of the three. But in the East, the liturgy goes on for three hours. But they are there for an hour, the last hour, and they do have time to get into mode of receptivity and calm, because the whole liturgy is very much that way inclined. They are bathed in otherness and quietness. It's a whole mode of receptivity where all they have to do is actually pray and the odd sign of the cross, the kissing of icons and so on, it's done for them, and so they are free to do what? The very thing that they're for. Whereas if we are all the time when we're in church doing things on the outside of our innermost self, then we're even in church, God favoured, in the encounter and the perception of the still small voice. So that's just one illness that we have to be aware of as we start this new year, that the greatest enemy of our soul in our day is noise.
There are too many ones upon the air that carries currents all. The smallest sound disfigures meanings great. And only where is little said is depth of hearing found. I have known moments where a silence great heard many things. For where clings soul to soul the matter that here matters carries weight. When in a word unsaid was heard the whole. And I have heard a sermon of much length that heard was not, for that it would not end. When but a phrase ends not, for that its strength it knows unto its echo yet to lend. For echoes are but spectres, yet live on. There where loud emptied skulls they all have done.